All right, let's pray and jump right into 1 Samuel 8 this morning. Father, we thank you so much for all those who are part of our church family and those who are visiting. We pray, Lord, your blessing on this time. It is by your Holy Spirit, using your Holy Word, Lord, that we are transformed into your likeness and image. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us grow this morning. I pray, Father, that we would let go of the things we need to let go, that we would trust you in the ways we need to, and that we would also, Lord, be content and appreciate and be thankful for all that you are doing, have done, and are going to do in our life. We thank you for this time. Give me the help I need, Lord, to just teach your word clearly. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, the title this morning is The Grass Isn't Greener. Now, there's some cultural and popular proverbs and even misquotations oftentimes thrown out there. I'm sure you've heard all of these before. I'm going to start with some non-biblical proverbs or sayings. God helps those who help themselves. Have you heard that? It's not in the Bible. Don't. It's actually the opposite of what the Bible teaches. Um, the Bible teaches that uh, we are to obviously do our part, but God helps us when we cannot help ourselves, right? That statement actually comes from a proud heart. I'm going to do what I'm going to do, and then God's going to help me, all right? That's not right. What about God will never give you more than you can handle? Probably the most popular unbiblical <laughs> saying that people think is biblical. The Bible does not say that God will not give you more than you can handle, because the reality is God does give you more than you can handle so that you rely upon him. Is that not true? Have you seen that play out in your life? You're right. Sometimes you're like, I can't handle it. You're right. You can't. You need the Lord to be able to handle it. What about to thine own self be true? <laughs> that is so not biblical. It's actually Shakespeare. And it's the opposite of what the Bible teaches. Don't not to thy own self be true. It says die to yourself and live to God. What about the semi-biblical or misquoted sayings? Money is the root of all evil. <laughs> There's a country song that says it exactly like that. It's not money is the root of all evil. It's the love of money. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> what about if you can't say anything nice, then don't say anything at all? Now, it's a good parental advice <laughs> and pastoral advice, but it's not biblical. It's actually a loose paraphrase of the golden rule, and I will never think of the golden rule the same since a little interaction I had with, it was Luke at the time. I don't always name which kid it's about um, in my stories, but this was Luke. And I'll never forget it because I was trying to reason with him, who was six years old at the time, after he had hit his younger brother. And so I threw out the golden rule. I'm like, buddy, don't you remember what the golden rule is? And uh, he says, yeah, dad, do to others what they do to you. <laughs> and I'm thinking that sounds, that's wrong, like way wrong. I go, no, buddy, that's not right. He said, um, yeah, do to others what they do to you. He hit me, so I hit him. All right, I don't know where you're going with that, but that's actually wrong. Now, the other one that uh, is not necessarily biblical, but it can be derived from Scripture, is people will say the grass is always greener on the other side. That's not the same. The grass is always greener. You have to throw the word not in there. The grass is not always greener. The truth is, it sometimes is. It depends on what side of the fence you're on. If you're on God's side of the fence then it's not greener. But if you are on the world side of the fence, looking over at God's side, yeah, it is greener. And it depends on where you're at. And we're going to see this morning that Israel got it all wrong during the time of Samuel. They were looking over the fence at their unbelieving pagan neighbors going, man, we should be just like them. And that is quite a tendency we have in the church and as Christians today to look at our unbelieving neighbors and friends and go, man, I'm missing out. I want what they have. Shouldn't it be the opposite? Shouldn't they be looking over the fence at you going, man, what is different about them? Yet oftentimes they look at Christians around them, they go, they're just like me. 
They talk like me, act like me. Why, what am I missing that they have? We should be separate, we should be different, and we'll see that. But I have to kind of lay down the groundwork for some of you who may not have been here for 1 Samuel. I'm just going to take a couple minutes to tell you about last week where Israel, they lost the ark. It came back into their territory, but not where the Israelites wanted it. The Ark of the Covenant settled in kiriath Jerim, and for 20 years, God allowed the Ark to not return to its rightful place where it was supposed to be in Israel. A 20-year delay, and it gave Israel time to consider and contemplate where they were at in their spiritual life. You and I need time to think about where we are in our relationship with Christ. If we are only busy and only filling our schedule with a bunch of things, we will not consider the true condition of our souls. And that's what Israel had time to do. And so Samuel calls them to repent. He says, if you're going to turn back to the Lord, then you need to do these three things. Return to him, direct your heart to him, and serve him only. And we talked about how hard that is sometimes. We want to serve Jesus just a little bit and serve ourselves the rest of the week. God wants us to serve him only. And then they gathered together, all Israel. Samuel got them together and they gathered, they prayed, and they sacrificed to the Lord. And while they are worshiping in this way, the Philistines line up and battle against them. The Philistines start to attack. Samuel cried out to the Lord and God delivers them miraculously by sending the Philistines in a total state of confusion. God was showing his people, I will protect you. I am your security. But today we're going to see they wanted more. They wanted a king, a military leader to give them security, a man rather than the Lord. The result is, however, Samuel erected that stone called Ebenezer, which was the stone of help as a, I coined coined a new term last week, a memorial, (laughs) remembrance and memorial. Did not do that on purpose. Uh, That was called to my attention later. It's kind of a weird thing being a pastor because people will tell you things that you said that you didn't know you said. I know most of you caught that one, but memorial stone. And so they remembered what God had done for them in helping them thus far. And it was so later generations could point back to that and say, see what the Lord Almighty has done for you and me. Do you have memorial stones set up in your life and in your family that your kids can point to and go, wow, remember when God did this for mom and dad. Remember when God did this for us when we were kids. I mean, just yesterday, Haven had her first gymnastics competition of the year. She did excellent. So proud of her. But it was at Jen's home gym where she grew up. At four years old, she started gymnastics. It was at that gym, New Hope in Fountain Valley, and her coach, who's fighting lymphoma right now, came to the meet just to watch Haven. It was an amazing day. But as we're driving through the parking lot, I said to Haven, Haven, this parking lot is the place where your mom saw me for the first time. (laughs) And it was. Our wrestling gym in high school was in the same parking lot as Jen's gymnastics gym. Jen was coaching at the time, and our team would go run through the parking lot to the riverbed, run a few miles, and run back. And one day, I'm in the midst of these guys, and I'm running, and Jen picked me out. She sure did. We didn't meet again for another year. That's right. So, I don't know. God clearly blinded her to the other guys. I'm not going to argue. So, but it's that memorial that, hey, that place is where God did something really neat. And we should have those times and things set up for our kids to know and our grandkids and others around us the great things God has done. So why don't we go ahead? We're going to read 1 Samuel, the very end of 7. And I want to show you the result of good godly leadership like Samuel and what we're going to see, poor, ungodly leadership of King Saul. So why don't you stand with me in honor of God's word. We'll read it together. 1 Samuel, we'll start at 7. And we're actually going to read 13 because I want you to see 
the summary of what it tells us about Samuel's leadership. Verse 13, after God delivered the Israelites, verse 13, so the Philistines were subdued and did not again enter the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. The cities the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel from Ekron to Gath, and Israel delivered their territory from the hand of the Philistines. There was peace also between Israel and the Amorites. So there is a difference because I want to read to you. I'm just going to read it. 1 Samuel 14, 52. This is Saul's leadership. There was hard fighting against the Philistines all the days of Saul. So Samuel, there was peace with the enemies of God. Saul, there was war. That tells you about their leadership right from the start. But look at 15. Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. He went on a circuit year by year to Bethel, Gilgal, and Mizpah. He judged all Israel in all these places. Then he would return to Ramah, for his home was there. And there also he judged Israel, and he built there an altar to the Lord. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice, only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest, to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out, because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, but there shall be a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And when Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Obey their voice, make them a king. Samuel then said to the men of Israel, Go every man to his city. You can be seated. Sad state of affairs. We see the summary of Samuel's ministry. We see the next generation of judges, his sons. We see the people's rejection of Samuel. Samuel's warning. And the hard-headed people getting their way. Let's look at 15 to 17 together. Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. What does it mean that he judged Israel? That word in the Hebrew means to judge or make decisions for, to lead, defend, and govern over. You see, the judges in the book of Judges, which there were 12 of them, were ones who God raised up to lead and govern the people because there was no king. You had Moses. And Joshua, they led God's people. Now, then you had the time of the judges. They led portions of God's people. And then Samuel became the judge who governed over God's covenant people. But the people don't like that. 
They're different than the nations. They want to be just like the kingdoms around them and have a king and an earthly ruler to rule over them. Samuel, however, was the one God picked and they didn't like God's man. But look at what Samuel did, how devoted he was to God's work. He went on a circuit year by year to Bethel, Gilgal, and Mizpah, and he judged Israel in all those places. So he started in Ramah, his hometown, and then he went to each of these cities and came back, and he did this every year. Now, Samuel is the first of the circuit preachers. America, we have a rich history of circuit preachers, if you look at our past and history. And I came across in the 1800s a group of preachers known as saddlebag preachers. They ministered, many of them were Methodists, and it caused the growth of Methodism in our nation through exponential means. There was something like 2,400 or 4,000 Methodists at one time, and in it was like a 10 year time period, the number of Methodists went up to 250,000. And it was largely associated with these saddlebag preachers. They would hop on their horse. They would ride through the Appalachian Mountains to places where they did not have pastors. And they would go on a circuit. And they would preach to this town and that town and this cabin and that cabin. I'm like, man, I was born 200 years too late. Like, this is amazing. Now, I want to read to you this little account from uh, Appalachian Magazine. They said, in an age of fancy pants televangelists, soft-spoken ministers, and almost cartoonish local clergy, it might be difficult for the average American to understand that not too long ago, there was a sect of preachers who feared neither man nor beast. Standing head and shoulders above most, these fearless men of God braved terrifying storms, endured hunger, and battled deadly gangs at nearly every turn simply in order to fulfill their calling to faithfully execute the scriptures. Recalling his childhood memories of seeing these men firsthand, Edward Eggleston wrote, more than anyone else, the early circuit preachers brought order out of this chaos in the frontier. In no other class was the real heroic element so finely displayed. Oh, how I remember the forms and weather-beaten visages of the old preachers whose constitutions had conquered starvation and exposure, who had survived swamps, alligators, Indians, highway robbers, and fevers of all kinds. How was my boyish soul tickled with their anecdotes of rude experience? How was my imagination wrought upon by the recital of their hairbreadth escapes? How was my heart set afire by their contagious religious enthusiasm. Where are preachers like that today? So many want an easy time. They don't want to sacrifice. They don't want to lay it all on the line. That's a different breed, is it not? And I believe guys like that created disciples that were worth emulating. There's a story um, that a guy tells. At the end of one weary day in the North Carolina backcountry, the itinerant preacher Thomas Ware sought shelter at the isolated cabin of a young couple. The man gave me to understand at once that I could not stay there, recounted Ware. So this young couple, the guy's like, nope, you can't stay here. He says, I looked at him and smiling said, well, that would depend upon our comparative strength. Unwilling to wrestle the Methodist preacher, the couple relented, and in the morning, Ware baptized their children. (laughs) So they were also wrestlers, right? It all comes back to wrestling, folks. But this guy, they're like, nope, you can't stay here. And he's like, well, it just depends on who wins in a wrestling match. They're like, all right, guess you win, and he got to baptize their kids. I love it. But you see, Samuel was a saddlebrag preacher. He went and he lived in other conditions and other places to make sure everybody could hear the word of the Lord. And that's what he did. And he would return to his hometown of Ramah, and there he judged Israel, and he built there an altar to the Lord. Why is Ramah, that city, important? If you remember, that is where Samuel's mom and dad were from. They went from Ramah to Shiloh every year. 
So what does that mean? Because Hannah sacrificed Samuel. He gave him to the Lord to live in his presence all the days of his life. So after he was weaned, she didn't get to raise Samuel. But could it be that God gave Hannah an opportunity to know Samuel later in life? Even if she wasn't still alive, Samuel had brothers and sisters in Ramah. And he got to enjoy his family. Isn't that cool? Doesn't God have a way of giving so much more back when we sacrifice to him? And Hannah is a great example of that. And he built an altar to the Lord there and sacrificed. But look at this next generation. It's not so cheery anymore. Uh, Verse 1, when Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. Already, you should be thinking about the previous priest that Samuel replaced, Eli. How did it go for Eli and his sons? Not so good. Eli is described as being old and fat. Not how you want scripture to talk about you, right? And yet his heaviness is mentioned because his sons were breaking God's covenant, showing hatred for the sacrifice, and were taking uncooked meat for themselves, the fatty portions, and their dad, Eli, was eating it with them. Their sons did great wickedness and evil, and God sought to put them to death and remove Eli and his whole household from the priesthood. So this seems kind of reminiscent, doesn't it? Look at verse 3. Yet his sons, Samuel's sons, did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. You're like, geez, if you read through Scripture where you have one man of God and what happens to his children after, you're like, man, it does not look so good, does it? It is not always the case. But in general, you got to ask that question, is it a good thing for sons to follow in the family business? Many dads are like, man, I really want my sons to take what I've built and continue on with it. Now, that can be good in some circumstances. But biblically speaking, in general, it's probably not. Because most of the time, you have the son never coming out from the shadow of his dad and being his own man. He's always in the shadow of his dad, can never measure up, or always has to try And it's just a bad scenario most of the time. Not always. There's always an exception to those things. But in general, it's not playing out real good in the priesthood, is it? Now, there's occasions where it does. But in these ones with Eli's sons, definitely did not go good. And now even Samuel, his sons did not walk in his ways. Now, the difference is God's word says that Eli's sons did great evil and God wanted to kill them. God's word does not say that about Samuel's sons because Samuel is still faithful. And I believe his faith had a measure of protection over his sons. But his sons perverted justice. They took bribes. And so they were not going to be allowed to be judges. Because of that, God's people are seeking another leader. And that's where it ends up affecting all Israel, seeking a king like the other nations. But look at this rejection. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together, came to Samuel at his hometown in Ramah, and said to him, Behold, you are old. That's a great way to start a conversation, is it not? <laughs> you know things are going south. We can usually tell when the conversation is going to be a tough one. And somebody's like, you know what, you're old. You're like, here we go. Um, my wife's learned a great trick. Um, she's, we were joking about this the other day. Because she'll introduce topics. She's really wise. And, and she'll say to me, okay, I'm going to say something that you're probably not going to like. So she's prepping me, but in my own stubbornness, it's like, oh, you think I'm not going to be okay with this? I'm going to be okay with this. <laughs> she's really smart, right? And it's like, okay, but it gives me, on another side, it gives me a moment to compose myself and go, okay, I can be prideful right now and be defensive or I can try to listen to what she's saying, right? That not that what God would have us to do? To listen to those who love us? Now, is there a way to introduce those topics in a loving, kind way? Yes. 
Can you introduce them in a kind, loving way and the other person still freak out? Yes. Don't be the freaker outer. <laughs> right? We all fail in that at times, but we have to be ready to hear and listen and maybe learn from it, right? And so they're saying here, behold, you're old and your sons do not walk in your ways. So this is what we want you to do. Appoint for us a king to judge us like all the other nations. Now, the elders of Israel had a very narrow view of what leadership meant. They just wanted military protection. They looked at these other nations. They see these kings leading their armies into battle, and they're going, we don't have any guy like that. We want the epitome of power and strength and intimidation. We want a king who nobody wants to mess with. But when we go out to battle, we, got, we don't have a guy. We got an old prophet. And he doesn't go into battle with us. He prays. We don't want prayer. We want swords. <clears throat> and so that's what Israel's looking for. They want security in human means. I wonder how many of us want security in human means. I would be at peace and not be stressed out if I had X amount of dollars in the bank. Financial security. I don't know. Some of the most financially insecure people are those with a lot in the bank. Because they realize how quickly it can go away. In any moment, God could change the whole dynamic of our economy and all of us could be in deep, deep trouble. And yet, we need to trust in the Lord for what we need. Israel was not learning that lesson. But notice, you see, the problem here is God's covenant people, God chose them to live separately. He called them out of the world. That's why he called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldeans to be his chosen people. Be different. Be separate. I will be your God. You will be my people. And you are going to be different than any other nation in all the world. And yet that special holy nation is going, but we don't want to be holy. We want to be like those guys over there. Is that not the temptation in your heart and mind? To look at our unbelieving friend's Facebook and go, man, I want to do what they're doing. That looks like so much fun. If only I wasn't a Christian and I could do this and that. Or maybe I can do this or that and still be a Christian. Is that really what pleases the Lord to be like the unbelieving world and give them nothing to desire from our life? Shouldn't they be wanting what we have? The whole point of Israel is that they were to be a light to the dark nations. That they would go, wow, look at the law these people follow. Look at the God whom they serve who created that law. Look at the order to their society and the beauty of it. We want that. We want their God. That's how the church is meant to be today. People should come here and experience the most loving, gracious, truth-filled people that they encounter all week. And I hope that's the case here at Grace. Can it sometimes not be the case? Yeah. I've heard people say to me, you know, my family member, they used to come here or sometimes they come here, but every time they come, somebody says something stupid to them. You know, if somebody hasn't been here a while, shut your mouth. Amen. Seriously, like just love on them. Be like, hey, love you. So good to see you. Don't be like, where you been? Oh, Glad you finally showed up. Or if somebody comes in late, give them a dirty look. No. Like seriously, you don't know what they just went through. You don't know what's going on at home. Now, if you're habitually late, like suck it up and get it together. Right? I mean, your boss doesn't put up with it. God's probably like, come on, please like don't skip out on the worship. Like be a part. Okay? But... Don't say things, oh, I'm just speaking truth. No, you're being a bonehead, Amen. okay? Just love on the person, okay? I don't like hearing that stuff, so let's make sure we're not doing it, all right? But here, they're trying to be like the nations. Don't get sucked into comparing yourself with somebody's social media life and your real life. 
Okay? What is posted on social media is not real. It is the highlights of a broken life. Your life is the one God has given you. You need to live that one to the fullest and not think you're missing out. Because you are missing out if all you're doing is looking at somebody else's life and not living your own. Verse 6, this thing, them asking for a king, it displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. Why did it displease Samuel? Think about it. It's like if all of you came to me or a delegation of you came after a Sunday service and go, you know, Pastor Phil, uh, we really want a, a senior pastor to pastor over us. I'd be like, I'm pretty sure you have one. Uh, nice to meet you. Um, but that's what they did. They're going, look, we don't, you're old and your sons are screwing up. So, you know, we want you to find us somebody else. So that obviously greatly distressed Samuel. So what did he do? He prayed to the Lord. What do you do when you get displeased or distressed? Go to Facebook? Go to this person? Go to that person and tell them all that what's going on in your life that you don't like? You, you and I need to go to the Lord in prayer first before we talk to anybody else. Because talking to Him will curb what we actually say and filter out what we don't need to say. Go to the Lord in prayer first. And the Lord said to Samuel, he answered. And it's not what Samuel expected. God's like, obey them. Do exactly what the people want in all that they say to you. Why? Because they've not rejected you, but they've rejected me from being king over them. This is a principle I want you and I to think about carefully for a moment. We have friends or family members who may reject us. Totally do something inappropriate, hurtful, unkind that hurts us deeply. Now, if it's something that you have done that's wrong, then make it right. But sometimes it's just the fact that you love Christ, they know it, and they don't want anything to do with you or the God who you're following. So they reject you. And God in that moment is saying, look, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. It's Jesus in you that they have a problem with. And so that takes a little of the sting out of it when you realize, you know what? They're just fighting against the Lord. And I need to pray for them more. That'll keep that arrow from sinking deep within your heart. And it'll guard you from bitterness. So make sure you understand appropriately and discern when it's just them fighting against the Lord. Okay, but God says, obey them in everything that they say. So God is, in essence, giving them exactly what they want. Be careful what you ask for. Because sometimes, God will give you exactly what you want. And that can be the worst thing you could have ever experienced. You have to be careful what you ask for from the Lord. Our kids, um, because of their foster care background, have had in the past and still have a little bit an issue with food. Um, if you're close with my, our family, we've talked to you about it, or you work in children's ministry, you understand that we have to, for their own good, teach them how to manage some of the anxiety that comes up over food and water. It's a coping mechanism for them because they didn't have everything they needed at different seasons in their, in their life in foster care. And so early on, they would obsess and fixate over food. They would hoard it or they would consume far too much for their little bodies. And so at one point, it was, it was Luke again. So this is Luke's day. <laughs> um, he, he still does this, but... He eats like somebody's going to steal his food. And so he's just shoveling it down. And he would consume twice as much food as me. And he's this little five, six-year-old. And he'd get done and his stomach is just out to here. And we're like, buddy, you need to stop. And one day after 
again and again and seeing this pattern like we need to help break this because they'd get to the point where they'd eat breakfast huge bowl of cereal and 10 minutes later go mom when are we having lunch because they didn't always know when they'd have food right break your heart so with this day luke was just eating and drinking so much and jen goes you need no more he threw a fit she goes okay you can eat as much as you want but you're gonna pop He's like, no, I won't. She's like, okay, I'm warning you though. You can eat as much as you want and drink as much as you want, but you're going to pop. He's just pounding it, drinking. And, and he just finished like the last cup of water and literally half the contents of his stomach exploded out his face. <laughs> Boom, all over. And he goes, mom, I popped. You see, we gave him exactly what he wanted. He popped and lost almost everything he just gained. If you are not content with what your heavenly father has given you, and you keep asking and asking and asking for that which is not good, God may just give you that thing, and you may pop and lose what you had just gained. Can we learn from our kids and from God's word that we need to be careful what we ask for? Israel did not obey the voice of Samuel. Verse 10, so Samuel, look at this, we'll, we'll jump to 10, I love this. Um, so Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said this, he gives them a grim picture, okay, this is what you want, this is what's going to happen, just like Jen warned Luke. He said this, these will be the ways of the king who will take and who will reign over you. Notice how many times the word take shows up. He will take your sons and appoint them to be his chariots and to his horsemen and to run before his chariots. Verse 12, he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands, commanders of fifties, some to plow his ground, some to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards, give it to his officers and servants. He will take your male servants and your female servants, the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day do you see how many times a king will take from the people the very guy the kind of king they wanted they wanted a military leader yet they needed a shepherd after god's own heart look at saul a military leader literally a head taller than everybody else in israel he was the man's man he was the one that everybody wanted to follow. Nobody was taller, bigger, or better looking. That's what it says about Saul. But his heart was desperately wicked and foolish. Yet God knew the people needed a shepherd after his own heart. If you're single today, you need to pray first and foremost that God would pick you the spouse he has for you. Because sometimes exactly what you want, you're like Israel going, I want tall, dark, and handsome. And God's like, be careful because I might give you exactly what you want. And that's going to be a disaster. He's like, I can handle the looks category, but you need a person who has a heart after me first. Same thing, gentlemen, young man, my very own son, you need to pray for a woman who has a heart for the Lord first and let God take care of everything else that matters to you. But here, Israel, they lost it. They lost sight. They didn't heed the warning. And God says, you're going to cry out to me and I won't answer you that day. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. They said, no, but there shall be a king over us that we also may be like all the nations. Is this not painful to read? 
and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Oh, they wanted somebody else to fight their battles for them when God was more than able and willing to fight on their behalf. Look at 21. And when Samuel heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. Big tattletale. (laughs) Samuel told on the people to the Lord. He said, can you believe they said no to me? They said, no, we're going to have a king anyways. And the Lord said, obey their voice and make them a king. So Samuel then said to the men of Israel, go every man to his city. You see, there's a few principles we need to take from this passage this morning. Number one, be careful what you ask for. God may give you exactly what you are so determined to get and you just might pop and lose most of what you have gained. Be careful what you ask for. Two, God is more than enough. They wanted an earthly king, yet God was their heavenly king. God had already proven himself time and time again, yet they wanted something other than God. Christian, brother and sister, listen to me. So often you and I can in our heart start to think, Ah, the Lord's just not doing it for me. I'm missing something. Well, are you, are you praying? Are you reading your word? Are you gathering together with God's people? Are you doing the things that feed your soul? Because if you're not, of course you're going to stop longing for Him. You're going to forget what He's like. You're going to forget His goodness. But if you are with Him, spending time with Him and His people, you will be kept secure in your faith. Three, stop comparing or coveting what other people have. You see, Israel couldn't see how green the grass was on their side of the fence. All they could see was the other side. They thought it looked better and they kept comparing. Just last night, we're standing in the kitchen and uh, Jen is doing something on, at the kitchen counter and she goes, so uh, what are you preaching on tomorrow? You know, she's trying to get a sneak peek or whatever. I said, you got to wait like everybody else. No. Of course I didn't say that. And so I said, well, and I gave her a quick little summary, which actually helps me tremendously because if I go, oh, I don't know, <laughs> she's going to be really concerned about the condition of her pastor's preparation, right? So I said, well, and I summarized everything I just said to you about the grass isn't always greener. And what it means in regards to Israel always wanting and wanting a king instead of what God has provided. And I go over to my computer and I'm about to type something and Jen goes, yeah, the grass isn't always greener. So water your lawn. (laughs) Oh, you're good. That's the reality. If you are where God has called you, if you know him, then the grass is not greener. So water your lawn. Make the best of the lawn God has given you. Now, we have a Norco landscape at our house. It means dirt, right? I'm not watering it because we have to regrade everything. But when you are in need of a beautiful green pasture, there is some responsibility you have to take care of what God has given you. Water your lawn. Take care of your life. Get the weeds out. Enjoy what God has given you. So how can we make sure that the grass on our side of the fence stays green? Well, if you are serving God only, you are in His Word and following Him, that grass will be greener and you are not missing out. In that sense, the grass is not greener. But if you are not serving the Lord and you're on the wrong side of the fence, then yes, the grass is greener on the other side and you need to switch sides. You need to stop serving yourself and you need to serve the Lord only. He needs to be your king, not your own desires. Teaching children self-control is just as difficult as teaching adults. Is it not? We had a, this isn't Luke this time. I'll end with this. Um, one of our kids taking his money and buying snacks in, vending, in the vending machine. 
which we didn't know about, which can be very dangerous um, for him uh, because of allergies and such. And we had to teach him about self-control in that. And it was a good lesson. And he listened and he heard. But we're like, look, just because it's there doesn't mean you need to have it. And I said, if you understand self-control now, it will help you tremendously when you're an adult. If you can say no to your desires now, just because it's there doesn't mean you should take it or buy it or use it. Can we listen to that, folks? Dealing with our sinful desires is very difficult, and you need God's help. So, that's a lot to chew on. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time in your word. We thank you, Lord, that you have promised to be our King and our God, our Savior and our friend. And I pray, Lord, that we would serve you only. I pray that we would not look longingly at the unbelieving world, desiring their delicacies or their pursuits, but may we, Lord, receive all that we need in your side of the yard, in your fence. I love what G.K. Chesterton said about your backyard is not a place where the fence is meant to keep you out but is a fence meant to keep you in that you might run wild and free. Lord, you want us to run wild and free in your presence, in the safety of your yard, glorifying you. And I pray that we would enjoy the freedom you have given us in Christ. Help us, Lord, to not live like the unbelieving world, but help us to be separate, to be different, and to be your people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.